So this talk is gonna be about how people quit vegan and raw vegan diets and why they do it and uh, why so many people leave this diet. Do you know anyone who quit this diet? Yeah, exactly. Like pretty much if you in this lifestyle for a year or more, you would know several people who tried it and quit at some point. And uh, to start, I just want to play a video of a guy who used to be vegan and now he eats meat and everything. And just to see the perspective, what people feel about it and how they explain why they quit and what actually happening. And then we go into neurology of what actually happened. What's up guys, it's Primitive Roots here, Create Environment, where we can connect deeper. In this video, I want to talk about MGTOW and meat eating, and why I think it's so crucial for men to eat meat, as well as women, but ultimately I want to focus on the men aspect, because for me, my own personal experience, eating vegan, excluding meat from my diet, animal products, I realized how much it made me overly sensitive, overly empathic. It pushed me too far to the feminine side of my being and not allowing me to embrace my own masculine divinity. And once I began eating meat again, I was able to incorporate my own grounded space of masculinity, of logic, and of ultimately connecting with the, the spirit of my own being. When I ate meat again, I felt that connection. I felt the unison between masculine and feminine. And I think it's so crucial for men to incorporate meat into their life and I know there's a huge problem with the, the industry around me, and there's a lot of misconnection, misinterpretation of our natural... Uh... Well, this is enough for beginning, but the, the problem, you can see how this guy describes it, that uh, he just felt that he became a bit too sensitive, overly sensitive, and, uh, and this is not just one story. It's typical. And uh, coming from Russia, we had like a huge community who used to be raw vegan or vegan, and then they are not. And they don't understand what's happening, but how they explain it, that you get all sorts of uh, kind of problems. Uh, they call it psychological, but it is actually neurological, and we go into science of it deeper in this talk. And let's just start from the beginning. So there is a something in the physiology of all complex mammals, and it's called mechanism of animal behavior control. So does anyone have any ideas how any, any animals being controlled? Like what controls his instincts. movements, instincts? Yes, good guess. Okay, anything else? Emotion. This is very good guess. So, yes. Um, let's look at how it all works. So, first, there is a situation. Uh, some kind of situation happening. For example, it's the, you know, for bear, it's the summer and the winter he has to go to hibernation and he needs to fatten up. So that's the situation. And then his neurological system, based on his uh, genetic information, uh, so throughout the evolution, um, so many bears went to hibernation. The ones who didn't, they died out. And then it's got, information got collected, how to do it the best. And all this huge amount of information is stored in DNA in genes. And then neurological system also takes into consideration your life experience. So for example, child trauma is a life experience and it will impact your life uh, if it stays there. Or for example, deprivation syndrome. It's uh, when animal being deprived from a food for a long period of time and then afterwards for the rest of his life, he can be very protective over food. So we went, uh, uh, several months ago, we went to Fiona Oaks' um, sanctuary, animal sanctuary. Do you know Fiona Oaks? Anyone watched the movie about running? No? No one knows? It's, it's a vegan woman who runs, who is vegan since she's three years old, and she runs ultra distances, and she has an animal sanctuary with five hungry animals. 
and we've been there, and it's crazy, and she and her boyfriend, they run it. And apart from that, she also trains a lot, like uh, 30 kilometers a day, she runs, she eats once a day, and all her time dedicated to this animal sanctuary. So it was a horse she, she there. She actually runs like elite times in marathons as well. Yeah, I mean, she, she, she runs a marathon in like 2.30, you know, and she's 53 years old. I mean, she's, she's still hardcore, like yeah. But the thing is, uh, they have one horse there and they keep her separated from the rest of the horses because this horse had a hard life and at some point it was deprived from food. And now if you put her together with other horses and you feed them, she becomes so um, uh, very aggressive and protective of food because of this life experience that it's, it becomes hard to manage her. So they feed her alone. This is a deprivation syndrome. And uh, so this is life experience. So your neurological system reacts on the situation according to uh, your genes, information, and your life experience, and sends the signals to amygdala. Amygdala is a part of the brain which underneath your frontal cortex is a small um, uh, almond-like uh, a bit in, in humans. And uh, it's in charge of our emotions, feelings, and immediate responses. And um, it's part of the limbic system, and this is a more primitive part of the brain, um, which in charge of these instincts and emotions, how uh, the, oh. someone says. And so uh, amygdala sends the signals to uh, endocrine system to release particular hormones and chemicals to make you experience these feelings, emotions, and instincts which you experience and do something in particular. So, um, in case with bear, uh, particular hormones being released and he feels hunger. He feels like, oh, I'm gonna, just gonna go and eat everything and, and pick the fattest bit of the fish and eat like caviar and brains if it's too much fish around so he can fatten up quicker. And then, yeah, this is the feelings here. He feels feelings, emotions, desires. But because we're humans, we look on uh, animals like, you know, they just animals, so we will call it instincts. But for humans, we call it emotions. Because, you know, we're a bit uh, biased <laughs> in this bit. So, in reality, uh, complex animals, they feel with same emotions, same feelings and desires as we do, just maybe it's, you know, they have different systems maybe the experience is slightly different but not that much different i mean if you had a dog you could see clearly it has emotions clearly and uh, that's the how the whole mechanism uh, works the main feature of this mechanism is reward mechanism so there is a chemically it could be a reward for a particular action which is biologically beneficial for this individual or it could be no reward. So basically, why, how bear knows that now he's supposed to eat because it feels good. He eats and it feels good. And if he eats fattier foods, it feels even better because he needs to fatten up. And this is how nature controls pretty much every complex mammal. And uh, we are not that different and we control the same way. And if you have enough reward from nature, and uh, one of the main uh, feature of rewards, it's a hormone called dopamine. And uh, if it's enough of it, you feel happy, you feel motivated, you feel inspired for life, you feel like, oh, I'm gonna achieve anything, I'm strong, it's good. And if there is a lack of reward, we say it is a clinical depression. And if you have, uh, for a long time, uh, low dopamine, then, uh, you can get Parkinson disease, like a disease, you know, which will affect the way your um, everything in the body works and muscles and stuff. And yeah, and people uh, who have no reward for a long time, um, they get, you know, they go into suicide, self-destructive behavior, because they're not motivated to live anymore and it's chemical, it's nothing to do with their personality, it's nothing to do with, uh, you know, feeling shame about it or blame them for this. This is just chemical. 
However, these chemicals could be produced if we do something different, if we think differently, if we give a support to this person, they will start to produce these chemicals. And then they will be more motivated to live and achieve and strive for the goals and everything. So every animal strives from here to there to get from no reward to more reward. Basically, we all motivated by pleasure. We want to feel good, we want to feel happy. But uh, there is misconceptions. People think pleasure is something, you know, there is some guilt attached to it. But I would say it's more like happiness. You genuinely feel better if you go towards this side. And there's nothing, nothing, you know. It's not that primitive for humans. It's not only food and reproduction, it's way more complex than just food and reproduction. Uh, so the one thing what you need to remember, that it is a progression, but there is no final destination. If it would be, we would hit it with heroin, surely. Because we are humans, we're very good in uh, producing all sorts of ways to get pleasure. And heroin is a good example of how we come up with um, chemical which generates so much pleasure at the moment that uh, it's just, uh, you know, outweighs every experience person ever had. And then when they come back from it, they feel not motivated to live anymore because nothing feels as good. Okay, next one. Yeah, so this example with bear, um, in uh, July, August, and in September, he would eat as much as possible to go hibernate. How he knows when to go hibernate, this is this mechanism in, in place. He doesn't, he most likely doesn't think about it, doesn't plan it like we do. He just knows. Because wild animals, they are in line with this, this mechanism. Okay, what happens to human and why we are not in line? <laughs> this is me. If you maybe recognize, and this is also, and this is not that many months in between. This is uh, June last year, and this is August last year. So um, the thing is, uh, there is a two um, two sides of human and also bear metabolism. One side is gaining. So when the bear eating. He feels like eating, he feels like putting on fat because he has to, that's his biological programming. And then in uh, winter, he will spend it and then wake up in spring and then do it all over again. Uh, for humans, uh, it's just the same if we lower the temperature around us, then we will start to feel like eating more fat, eating more concentrated calorie more sweet like eating like nuts and dates together and this is what happening to many people in the winter and it it is very easy to change if you just raise the temperature in your house you'll stop get fat because you will be not that motivated to eat more concentrated calories the time when um, lots of raw food is get off the diet is winter because they crave concentrated cooked food, uh, something fattier, something more mm, comforting, and it happens like completely down to this mechanism. Because it's winter coming, your body says, okay, it's cold, let's put on some fat layers so we can protect ourselves from, for, from the environment, and it's probably we're gonna need to survive the winter because we was evolving in situation when we had to go without food for a long time. And if the cold season coming, it means this time is coming when it's going to be tough. And this mechanism, amygdala limbic system, they don't consider that you have a central heating or you have clothing or you don't want to get fat <laughs> and this kind of stuff. And so people struggle in the winter, even on a raw diet, to not drift towards fattier, fattier things. But if you know it, uh, you will react differently on this. 
And if you <coughs> prepared that this is what's going to happen, you can always change it by in the winter do more exercise and then control it this way because as soon as you start to start to do exercise, you'll feel your hunger goes down. As soon as you start to live in the warmer house, like just turn on the heating, you'll see your hunger, especially for fatty concentrated things, will go down a little bit. So, and this is, uh, I was two months in uh, a very hot climate and also I was running. Uh, so like I lost, this is 61 kilos, this is 52. So how many? Nine, nine. nine kilos, yeah, very quickly. <laughs> and the thing is, it's natural for your body to be able to go up and down, up and down, build muscle, consume the muscle, like uh, consume the fat, build the fat reserves, it's healthy. It's healthy if you can go up and down. If you don't wish to go up and down, you don't have to. You uh, control it by your situation. So this was the situation. I was working on computer in UK for six months and then came to Russia. It's so cold climate and it's cold in the houses. So that's what happened. <laughs> and this is hot climate running. This is what happens. Okay. So for the animals, uh, the thing is, uh, animals at the moment is being extinct very quickly. So in uh, last century, uh, 500 species have gone extinct and uh, 777 of them, uh, yeah, for, oh, 477 of them got extinct because of the human activity. And it's not like we killed them all, however, we did to some of them but we just deprive them from their habitat or change something in the habitat the way that their mechanism of behavior control cannot adapt so quick and they still go the old ways and it doesn't work and there is many examples for example we cut the, the rainforest and then uh, you know for orangutans is nowhere to live and they can't just live, you know, among the people. They get into conflict with each other and all sorts of stuff happening, fortune happening, and there's not enough food and, and you know, species getting, like, we're driving them towards extinction. Or with the bees, we pollute the air. They can't adapt to it because it's artificial factor. They wasn't evolving in this situation and they die, die out. And there's a big problem in England with the bees. Like I coming from Siberia, we don't have this problem because the Siberia is so big that even like small human activity doesn't make such a big difference. So it's still quite a bit of bees, but this is a statistic. This is when the uh, human entered the continent and this is the wild population of animals. And I lived in Africa, now I think it's even here. And then this is Australia, you can see the drop. And then this is North America and the drop. And this is Madagascar and this is the drop. And uh, this kind of stuff happening when there is a drastic change in the an environment. And this mechanism which controls what animal going to do cannot adapt to it. Because the change happens too quickly or it is artificial, it has to do with human activity. And one of the examples, this is uh, in Uganda, I saw it many times in the evening, all the lights on, and huge amount of moths and insects come, and in the morning you go and it's like this deep in insects, they are died there. Why do they come? So like the, the scenario is moth going towards the light bulb, hitting it, falling, then gets up and doing it again, falling, gets up doing it again why is it natural like any ideas why he does it the moon. The, yeah exactly so the natural mechanism is uh, it's nocturnal animal he's supposed to fly towards the moonlight and starlight and on the way there he can do all his biological business 
And uh, this light is artificial, but he wasn't evolving in a situation where there is any other source of light apart from moonlight or starlight. And so he feels like going towards this light. He can't stop himself. He feels, no, this feels right, you know, like uh, he doesn't have a long-term memory or complex brain like we do. And he just drawn towards it and going and it, it brings his death, but he's still doing it. And uh, for us, it's so easy to just turn off the light so he can go on with his business. The thing is with humans, we get in exact the same situations, but not realizing we are this morph, which is getting in this vicious cycle of confused signals due to artificial situation, which we create in ourselves for ourselves. Uh, so uh, when it comes to human brain, there is a frontal cortex. It's the most recently developed part of the brain and it's in charge of planning um, future rational decisions, abstract concept, distant goals, and uh, all the self-control and logical thinking is happening there. And this bit we developed because we have to overcome limbic system. So uh, as a scientist emphasized, at some point it was some kind of uh, long time challenge something to do with the climate probably uh, where we had to overcome uh, the mechanism which was driving us to our extinction so we was like moths going towards something and we realized at some point that's not going to work we have to overcome it and develop this part of the brain and it developed fairly quickly uh, and uh, now we have a, because of this big part of cortex it's um, four times bigger than the one chimpanzee has and limbic system is this mechanism so amygdala is somewhere here uh, limbic system it's pleasure fear reward arousal and this is our immediate response to the situation so for a situation like uh, with morph this it would be a, this limbic system and this would be a human it would be a limbic system which would tell him go towards the light. And it would be a frontal cortex which would tell him, no, this is not a good idea. You need to go around it and then go to the moon or whatever you, wherever you need to go. And this bit, if we block it, if we stop using it, we basically stop being human. Because this is what, what separates us from their uh, chimpanzee, for example. I mean, chimpanzee, they still have thoughts, it's scientifically proven, they do, and, and gorillas as well. So you can, if you're interested, you can study the story of Gorilla Coco. And they even estimated her um, IQ, and it was like about 80, which is uh, kind of average for, almost average for African Americans. <laughs> but uh, he, she has a brain and she was able to uh, to learn language and uh, I mean it's quite interesting all the experiments they did with you uh, so for the human this mechanism looks a bit more complex <laughs> than for the moth so let's look at it uh, how behavior being controlled in humans so there is a situation coming in some kind of situation how do we perceive the situation any ideas how do we like how we assess the situation? What do we have? Yeah, so we have five senses. Uh, we have neurological system, which is kind of they say it's a sixth sense. But you know, like what do you, you know how you say you feel vibe, you feel like emotion of the person. That's our neurological system reads what the emotion of this person and you you feel it. It's not like you analyze the facial expression or something, it happens much quicker. And this is uh, one more sense, which are not always considered. Then uh, the other part of the situation, your body needs. So the signals which comes from inside the body, it could be pain or need for some nutrient, need for 
calories or need for sleep or something else, then there is something called intuition. Any ideas what intuition is? Any ideas? It just comes up. <laughs> it comes, yeah, it just comes up, exactly. So intuition, uh, it's outcome of our complex brain. Our complex brain constantly uh, gathering the information from outside, then analyzes it, and if there is any kind of specific task we have to do, or if there is any kind of specific, you know, um, specific thing we have to sort, then it can give us uh, the final calculations of all this information, including genes, including your life, previous life experience. What is the best course of action? It will give it to you in, send the signal in form of intuition, just bypassing the frontal cortex and uh, like the signals from various parts of the brain, they bypass in frontal cortex quite often, bypassing your logical thinking, and it's normal. It's not like something spiritual or something special. Ev like every complex mammal has it. Uh, like monkeys also have intuition, and some like wild animals have it usually much better than humans, because they're still in line with these natural mechanisms. So intuition is just a normal connection to, to your physiology, to your parts of the brain which collect and analyze information. The more information you can collect, the better your senses work, like your eyes, your ears, your taste buds, everything. The more uh, experiences you have, the better this mechanism will work because you just have more information to process. Um, so, and this is what we call intelligence. And people usually who have big life experience, lots of things they was exposed to, they more intelligent because of it. Okay, so situation coming in, uh, uh, genes and life experience being also taken into consideration, and uh, together with this, the limbic system forms the signals which come to you through your psyche. Psyche is it's our feelings and our even thoughts and emotions is everything basically what's going on in our head and heart if you metaphorize it if you like say it the way like how they were put in literature but this we call psyche and the psyche could could be more open or more closed any ideas what what's the difference what is the open psyche Open psyche is when you're very sensitive. Closed psyche when you're not so sensitive. And people genetically could be different. Due to cultural upbringing, they could be different. And uh, so Western people, they kind of a bit more closed if you compare them to Indians, to uh, some Asian countries, to some parts of Russia, not so much Moscow, it's more like this way now. And uh, it's our feelings, desires, desires, reactions, preferences, and thoughts. And these signals coming through it, and they influence our decision what to do uh, regarding this situation and how to act. And uh, there is this frontal cortex, this uh, very logical part of the brain, which is in charge of self-control, and it has also its input on the decision so like, for example, situation you go and pass McDonald's and maybe there is some smell which attracts you or something and the limbic system says, oh, it smells good, maybe coming, why not? And then your frontal cortex says, not a good idea, you, you know, you just visited fruit festival, seriously, let's go home, you have a photo ball in there and what's the point? And then you're making decision, okay, we just walk past and you act on it, and you, you pass. Um, there is a, um, a neurological system powers these signals. So how much of these signals you will receive through your psyche depends of how much energy you have in your neurological system. And uh, how it, it looks like, you know, a light bulb, if you put a very little voltage in your cables, then the light bulb will be dim. 
dim light. If you put a lot of voltage, then it will go into full capacity and will be mm, as bright as it could be. And same thing with neurological system and our brains. So if it's active and healthy, the signals will go at the normal uh, strength. And you will feel like you will feel what to do in the situation. And then according to your, uh, you know, like uh, logical reasoning, uh, you will combine these things, make a decision and act. But if your neurological system sedated by something, um, for example, some kind of drug like tranquilizer, you know, like they give to some MS patients, your sensitivity goes down and it's not as much energy goes to your brain and you like half asleep and you don't feel so much. And this is why they give it, because these people are oversensitive or the neurological system start to attack different bits of the body and so they sedate it in order to eliminate the, the symptom because people suffer. So in this case, if it's uh, very little power, then the signals will be slow, they will go through the psyche slow and uh, they will affect your decision not as much. So when you pass the McDonald's, you might not even feel the smell. It wouldn't like it, it would be very you wouldn't be that sensitive to it. Um, and then the other side of the story, if it's overactive, uh, you are overly will be overly sensitive. Um, and this happens in isolated situations. For example, if you go past the McDonald's on your own you will see that you would be more sensitive to this smell than if you go in a company of people. Because you talk, you get distracted, and, uh, and this will be less. So the signals will be not as much. So for people, for example, who, has, uh, who have uh, some mental disorders like schizophrenia and uh, bipolar, they could be um, overly sensitive because the neurological system aggravated and all the signals will be so strong and this kind of people, they struggle to get away from addictive substances. And uh, like they, can't, they need special care, kind of like kids. But the kids also, um, they are very often more sensitive to addictive sub substances, especially things like chocolate, and uh, because the neurological system is very active and because their psyche is very open, these signals go here very powerfully. And frontal cortex is part of the brain which has been developed uh, fully when you're 25. So when you're three years old, it's not that developed. It's like a, a chimpanzee, basically. Till you're five years old, it's like a chimpanzee. So to give kids freedom to choose things is not always a good thing. If it is natural situation, if they are in an organic garden, they can choose what to eat. If they are in McDonald's, it's not the best thing to give them a choice. <laughs> They're gonna go for the most uh, uh, pleasure center stimulating thing. So they will go for sweets or fat or the combined or sausage or something which stimulates them. So the frontal cortex fully developing by the age of 25. And uh, yeah, this is the mechanism and you can analyze yourself using this thing and see where your motivations come from and uh, then you will see why you made a particular decision. If um, the thing is there is a, should be a balance between signals coming from uh, through psyche and your frontal cortex uh, for sensible life. If you go too much this side, you're gonna be too much into your feelings and you're gonna make a silly decisions which not necessarily would be good for your health and you might struggle to stay on a diet. And this is what people, more sensitive people, struggle because at some point they feel like eating something what their uh, family eating they feel like eating something they just saw on the street uh, and if they would never get exposed to this situation where they see it 
they would not turn it, but because they're exposed, they're more sensitive to it, and they make these decisions. And it's not like it's not like they bad people, it's just some people more sensitive to it because of this physiological thing. Because some people being born with more open psyche and some people with not so much open and they train their frontal cortex, for example, if they had a job which was very intellectual, they are tend to make more rational decisions. And uh, so what happens if you go uh, on a raw diet, this bit and this bit becomes more powerful. So these signals, which come from limbic system, which your more primitive part of the brain, become stronger. And people don't understand it. They, uh, like pretty much everyone say, I start to feel more. Anyone start to feel more on the raw diet? Exactly. You become more sensitive. And this is natural. It means you are more capable. You, are, you can see more, you can feel more. You're more capable of feeling. It's not a disability. But if you go into the keto diet or paleo diet or any diet with a lot of saturated fat and animal products, uh, this will slow down your neurological system and it will slow down the signals and you will see that it's much easier to overcome the signals which come from your psyche. This is like this guy was saying, I became too sensitive on this vegan diet, so I had to eat meat to become more muscular. In reality, what you need to do, you need to exercise this part of the brain. So the balance shifted a little bit towards here and you just need to shift it back. And how to do it? Exercise more rational, uh, scientific or logic-based decisions. Uh, and also, you can also boost it with uh, like your masculinity. Just do more explosive, uh, hard exercise and you will boost your testosterone. You'll feel more masculine. You know, and do some boxing like do some heavy weight lifting and you'll boost your testosterone and if you feel like you're becoming too much into sensitivity you will balance it out with your situation not with your thinking it doesn't work like this it's only situation we are react on okay when it comes to food how do we make decisions what to eat so we have naturally a mechanism for this and this five different tastes so sweet one sweet one is the most important for us because we live on a simple sugars and our brain takes uh, simple sugars only and ketones for for um, powering and uh, we develop like there is emphasis that we develop this way because at some point we had access to a lot of simple sugars and it's not the thing is, it, it wasn't coming from cooked things, it's, it was fruit. And uh, it's very, very clear to science that we was evolving on fruit for a long period of time. So sweet is the only taste which we like undiluted. So we don't need salt to it, we don't need to add anything to it. It tastes great, you know, mango tastes great anyway. And then we have sour receptors, and sour receptors are very important because they identify vitamins and vitamin C in particular. It feels sour and we die without vitamin C. Anyone know what's happening if uh, we vitamin C deficient? Kaput. Hmm? Kaput. Uh, how in English, how it's called, you know? Scurvy. Scurvy, exactly. So you, you go for uh, 60, 90 days with no vitamin C intake, you'll see your tissue will start to fall apart. Vitamin C is part of synthesizing collagen. Collagen is the protein which is uh, in our skin, in other tissues, but in the skin, like it's very important. Collagen, yes, this is how you pronounce it in English? Collagen. Collagen, yeah. So without vitamin C, we cannot do. However, 
uh, our ancestor at some point, many million years ago, could synthesize it just like cats do. Cats can produce their own vitamin C, we cannot, because at some point, for a very long period of our evolution, it was coming from our diet, so we lost it. It wasn't, it wasn't used. Same thing happened to guinea pigs and several types of birds and all their top, uh, like, great, great apes, primates, they all lost it, just like us. Yeah, so we, we don't produce it. So it is very important. And kids, very often, they chew, like, some kind of sour plants, they look for some sour things, eat sometimes lemon, because they need vitamin C and they feel deficient. And they naturally don't it. So salty, why do we have salty receptors? To eat salt oh, every day, no? Any other ideas? Minerals. Exactly, yes. So salty receptors, it's not only to identify like a sodium, but it is to identify all sorts of minerals. Mm -hmm. And if you was exposed to natural food at some point, like um, wild greens and wild berries and stuff, and if you try them, uh, when you when your body is really hungry, you taste it, it tastes amazing. You know, like wild berries, wild strawberries, wild blackberries, they taste amazing. Because there's so much nutrients there. There is some minerals, there is some uh, sour, there is some sweet, there is, there is like just so much. And when you try a blueberry from the shop, well, it is a little bit sweet, but it's not, it's not like sparkling not like wild just from the tree because it's it's deficient it's already been deficient in um, in uh, sour elements or vitamins and it's probably deficient in minerals because it's grown artificially in poor soil and uh, so it's not that satisfying and uh, minerals is very important and you know if you like blend greens many people find it very tasty Anyone find green smoothie tasty? Yeah, that's because there's a lot of minerals there. When you blend it, you can actually taste it because you break the cells and it feels good. Uh, so, bitter taste. Why do we need bitter receptors? Cleansing. Hmm? As a cleansing. No, bitter receptors is important because it's something to do with our security. So in the wild, you see the berry, you taste it. If it feels, tastes bitter, most likely it's not edible for you. Basically, all the things which are bitter, you're not supposed to feed on. Unless you're very deficient in something from this particular food, and then and sometimes it tastes good, like dandelions. To some people, they chew them, they, they're kind of bitter. But if you have a particular deficiency, you kind of willing to tolerate this bitterness because there is some other taste to it, something attractive. And, um, but the most people, because they stimulate these receptors every single day, they can't feel anything. They, it's not happening. They can't feel anything. So the other receptor is umami. And umami, what it's for? Umami is for uh, identifying glutamates. Glutamate is amino acid is a very abundant in pretty much anything. And we identify amount of protein in the food <laughs> if we taste some glutamates on it. And umami we enjoy only if it's very diluted. Same like with salt, uh, we enjoy it if it's very, very diluted. Sweet, we can tolerate very concentrated, umami not. And umami is all these kind of foods and for Normal people, umami is uh, animal products. That's what they get umami taste from. And interesting thing that if you cook animal products, it becomes more of umami taste. It's more stimulating mm -hmm. and it's more pleasant. If you put meat in the water and you boil it, uh, the protein bro broke down and then glutamates getting released into the water. And when you drink it with the water, take a spoonful of soup, it goes very quickly to your receptor and it pleases it. And every culture develops some kind of soup because you can, you can stimulate your senses very quickly. And 
yet more pleasure. Also, what also uh, helped to raise the such uh, like the level of saturation of this taste is if you fry fry the high temperatures, then it tastes more umami. Uh, basically, for your brain, it says, "Oh, the, there is more protein in it," but it is artificial process. It's not something you can find in nature. So if you try everything raw, try raw fish, raw meat, uh, raw egg, you would not be that motivated to eat it. But when you cook it, when you salt it, when you put everything in it, you feel like very motivated. It feels good, it's, it stimulates. When you combine all this together, you can create a very successful product. And this is what we do. So basically, we combine all this, we stimulate these um, receptors, which sends the signals into our brain. Then we add some milk product to it, and milk products have casomorphins. So it's naturally, uh, your body is supposed to, uh, when you suck the milk from your mom, you're supposed to calm down and feel like pleasure, and calm and go to sleep, and digest all this whilst you're sleeping. And uh, same with the carbs, they're supposed to uh, come back for the milk. Casomorphine is an opiate which you create in your digestive system when you consume milk. If you ferment the milk, like we do with the cheese, uh, casomorphines form in this cheese already. So when you eat the cheese, it is very, very, feels very nice to your uh, pleasure center in your brain nucleus accompus and you feel like coming back to this food so cheese is the most addictive from all the milk products and that is a statistic so the other thing concentrated calories because of uh, for the long period of your evolution you was calorie deprived so in wild nature you know is always a competition and is always like was situation that you know, excess calories wasn't a problem. If you have excess, it means you're going to survive for next whatever days and months. Mm -hmm. So concentrated calories was always valued, and we still have it. So we have natural drive for fat, for oils, for anything concentrated. And when you cook food, the amount of calories being released, uh, which you can accumulate, is higher because uh, for example, if it's uh, starches, you can digest starches, otherwise you can't digest starches if you don't cook them. If it's uh, uh, vegetables, then you uh, break the fiber into the starch and then you digest it. It's much higher in calories. So you feel the more calorie per bite you get, the more pleasure you feel. And, uh, and accessibility is the other factor. Whatever is quickest to get, uh, which is what the fast food industry is basing its business on, whatever is quickest, you will get and grab this. So um, if you combine all these things, you're gonna have a very successful products and all their uh, cook, cook food industry is based on it. Every national food is based on it. It's usually some starch with salt and sugar and milk and fat all together, all the senses stimulated, very nice, everyone happy, let's make it a national dish. That's where we went as a humans. Like a mob, you understand? We created the system and then we fly towards it and then we have heart disease and die from it as a main cause of death. That's the situation in the world. So I just want to show you where I come from and why people uh, often feel like they just want to eat and eat and eat. This coming from deficiencies. So if you have a particular mineral deficiency, you will feel like eat and eat and eat because your body says, go and find it. Okay, if it's not enough, it just eat more. You understand, eat more. And uh, But when you have access to organic food, uh, to your organic garden, to very uh, rich mineral soils, you can grow your own vegetables and fruits, you eat a little bit of it very fresh and you feel satiated. 
And because uh, we was growing our own food for like my first 20 years of my life in Siberia, I know this. And when I came to England, I start to eat and eat and eat, and it's never satiating. I just keep eating. And my belly is like this, but I, I, I don't feel satiation. And I think that's the problem why uh, many of the people getting off the diet because they can never get satiated. So I, I, I want to encourage you to go into it. That's the wild berries, this is wild strawberries. And uh, they taste the best, uh, the best fruit ever. It's just, it's such a, it's like sparkling on your tongue. It's so many tastes there, it's so intense. It's very, very sweet as well. And uh, you eat like a little bit like this, and you are satiated and you can like run kilometers and kilo kilometers on it. It is not the, it's not the calories we need, like not like some calories, but not all of it is calories, is other nutrients as well. And uh, yeah, this is, you can grow your own wheat grass and this is some weeds, this is chickweed, this is um, fruits from our garden, raspberries. So to stay on a diet and be successful, what I find the most useful is to create a con a correct connection in your brain between particular type of food and reaction. And you will see if you manage to clean your body a little bit, when you eat particular things, start from easy things like alcohol, chocolate, you'll feel headache, sickness, feeling of nausea quite quickly. So you know it's not good for you. So you have this connection in your brain every time you want it. You go to your frontal cortex and say, okay, what was the reaction last time? It was headache, sickening and feeling and nausea. And you remind yourself and then you make a better choice. Then, okay, you, you experiment with nuts and seeds, eat a lot. And then you'll see oily, unhealthy skin, spots, sunburns, you even cannot digest sun as good anymore. Then you go into cook starch and then you'll see your skin is aging, you get sunburns, you get immune response, some kind of response going to happen. And if you remember every response every time and make these connections, and you will see, you will feel easier time making correct choices. And when you see, you live on juicy fruits, you live on cucumbers, watermelons, cucumbers, watermelons, especially good, you'll see glowing, healthy skin, hydration, and their healthy bowel movements. Uh, if you eat lots of greens, you'll see glowing, healthy skin, uh, high level of satiation and muscle building. And you connect the spins and remember it and remind yourself. And then you'll find easier time make correct choices. Uh, so juicy fruits, it's energy, healthy skin, satiation, and physical activities. And uh, pretty much everyone I work with, they feel like doing more exercise because it becomes easier. It, it, they feel energized. And then experiment with everything and animal products, stay away from them for some time, like three months, and they try, and, and you will see what, how you will react, you will not like it. The, the reaction will be physiologically not pleasant. You connect the spins and keep it in your brain. And to some people who really struggle, what I use, I use a, a day off from a raw diet. So they stay on a raw diet for one month, they, they go one day off, they eat everything they want, as much as they want. And I tell them, like, if you wish, eat as much as you wish. Next day they feel so sick. And then they remember it, they write it down, they make the connection, establish it very clearly, this is how it makes me feel. For most of the normal people, the problem is they never make this connection because every day cooked food, they don't understand where it comes from, like what reaction comes on what, it comes too late, and they never make the connection. But if you clean your body enough for one month, Stay 100% raw, and then after one month, experiment with a bit, you will see how your body will react. For some people, it's longer than one month. Yeah, so a few things, like for example, bread, uh, what I 
You see, it uh, makes your skin age and it makes you produce mucus. So, for example, if you're a runner, you eat a little bit of bread, you will spit some mucus whilst you're running. And this is normal. Most of people think, oh, it's normal. It's not normal. We don't produce it anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, this is just a few examples. I didn't know which ones to put, but uh, yeah, on natural high water content diet, what's gonna happen? Your skin have to shine. It will start to shine compared to what it was. Yeah, and uh, this is him. <laughs> He's a good example. This is Annette Larkins. She is 73. I never met her, but uh, that's is how she seemed to look pretty good in her age. And this is Christina. I also never met her, but she looks great, so it's a good example of shining face. Um, yeah, just a few words about when this diet doesn't work. So that's the girl. Uh, she was fruitarian for four and a half years in Russia. She uh, made this fruitarian.ru. It uh, like, was quite a big website. She inspired many people. And then she had a baby and then something happened. She started to have like severe neurological symptoms. She didn't know what it is. She felt it's psychological or something. But what, what she's saying, it all began with uh, boosts of uh, terrible internal heat and weakness and I couldn't do any job and look after my child. It was insomnia and then something terrible happened, very similar to a, a micro stroke, but doctor said it was we get a vascular dystonia, and uh, so I suffered for another six months trying to eat as much raw as I possibly could, but at the same time I couldn't feel good. And then this we get a vascular dystonia bothered me, mm, uh, various manifestations, heart pains, headaches, loss of sense of reality, as I was not me anymore, and a terrible fog in my head and I couldn't concentrate, and even panic attack happened once. And uh, she didn't know what to do, and, it, and she fig like she saw her reactions, and it happened more after eating fruit. So she figured it's probably fruit what is the problem. And then she tried cooked food and it helped a little bit, but then she tried animal products, and it really helped. Like her symptoms really reduced, and uh, now she's convinced that uh, raw. Diet high fruit is not natural. We have to eat animal fat and it has to be cooked and this is natural. You see like there is no logic there. But this is the symptoms of neurological disorder. And uh, I see it in many people and I work with people like this, especially when you have these reactions on fruit. It means your neurological system pumping too much electricity to your brain Every single uh, seems to be over exaggerated and people suffer and they get off the diet. Uh, like the guy, he says he became overly sensitive, but in her case, she became so overly sensitive, uh, it's, it, it's di diagnosable now. She couldn't concentrate, she couldn't work, she, it was insomnia. This is, this is a typical sign of neurological disorder when it's too much electricity going to your brain. And there is things you can do. Yes? I don't understand that quite well because she, she was on a food diet uh, previously, right? Four and a half years, yeah. yes. And then so something happened to your neurological system and it started to be like this. And it happened quite suddenly. And it was to do with she moved to India and I think she got uh, interested in spirituality and maybe she met someone and in India, they do neurological manipulations. They open people this channel in your neurological system where the voltage comes to your brain in order to enhance signals in the brain so you feel more, you're more sensitive. But if person is already sensitive enough, this is harmful. This is, this is harmful. And person cannot put it down himself. Only a particular lifestyle will slowly bring it down, but not all the way to how it was. And I work with people like this and it's the hardest thing to fix. Uh, and uh, 
yeah, this is what happened, and I have several other cases, but uh, I ran out of time, so yeah, that's what happens. And uh, the girl with who we run the Crimea, she had the same. She did Kundalini yoga and several other practices. She was very sensitive originally. She's an artist, so she already could feel a lot. But when she was practicing these practices, it really became very, very physically, and she started to really suffer, and it became so physical she couldn't walk. She couldn't think, she couldn't be, she couldn't do any job. And this was happening for, for years. And uh, only intense physical exercise, a lot of water interactions, so swimming in the water and being in the water. When you go in the water, ac excess electricity gets into the water and you feel better straight away, especially if it's cold water. And, uh, and uh, yeah, she kind of, she was able to heal herself, but not all, way, all the way to how she was, but to the level she could function. Isolation also contributed, so you need to get outside of your psyche and then you find it easier. Because when you concentrate on yourself, the voltage in your neurological system goes up and uh, it intensifies the symptoms. Yeah. There's the other guy here. Is, if you're interested, you can come and read what happened to him. Uh, he's from UK and he's quite a big guy. Uh, he's a, a personal coach. But uh, yeah, he had it to the point that he had to eat meat, meat broth, and uh, he couldn't digest anything raw, anything raw, just in order to stay alive. And this is severe thing with neurological disorder. And uh, this could happen if you do particular manipulations to your neurological system, like very intense spiritual practices or some interactions, some kind of spiritual healing when people don't understand what they do to you, they open particular channels and then they can't close it up and then you suffer. Askavanda? Hmm? Askavanda is taking this uh, um, uh, drug. Drug. Yeah, drug. drugs also do this. So like when you take mushrooms, for example, uh, psyche or psyche becomes more open than it was before and it never goes back to normality. Same happens to marijuana, to, but to a very small degree. And some other, you know, like, uh, psych, uh, how do you call it, psychedelic I drugs. Ayahuasca. I Ayahuasca, I yeah. Well, I don't know, I didn't experiment it myself, so I can't comment on it. But uh, definitely marijuana, I know how it works. It works this way, and there is there is a significant uh, change which happening. And in India, like many spiritual people, use marijuana to open people's psyche. And uh, yeah, in in some kind of cults, uh, well, I mean, every shaman use some kind of substance to open people's psyche. So it could be some neurological manipulation happening. But when you combine it with fruit diet, it doesn't work. So it's just a danger you have to be aware of. But uh, so when you you you're on a fruit diet and you're using those kind of uh, things, it's yeah. not necessary because you will become more sensitive anyway. You will become naturally as sensitive as you can according to your genetic uh, predisposition, because the voltage in your neurological system will raised to the natural level because you don't sedate it every day with any kind of other substances if you don't take alcohol you don't take any saturated fat or animal products any medicine which suppress then and you power it with fruit then it becomes normal uh, but if you use it continuously uh, you will get problems right uh, you use what you mean the the things yeah, which like the person if you go, go spiritually on a journey or you, you might get problems or not necessarily not everyone get it but or you do ayahuasca or, or, or so usually. if you have naturally I would say if you have naturally very open psyche so you're already quite sensitive this happens a lot to women because they naturally more open and then they put some <coughs> substances there and then they do some spiritual practice and then they do some spiritual healing and then they have a serious bipolar disorder or MS or panic attacks or something happening. And, and, I, and like many, many, many cases I know and most of it women, most of it women because we are more sensitive. <laughs>
Yeah, I have a little comment on that because I, when I did like this high high raw fruit diet, I did I swung the ayahuasca and everything, and I noticed with the people I did it with, it has not so much effect on me than on the other people because they already like vibrate high on this diet. So it can have even less effect on you when you're on this diet. But okay, you think this is a discussion for a different time? I don't know, I think that's what she was saying, is that the, the diet might not kind of open you up anyway, because yeah. it's depressing. So you can handle it, so I can handle it better. And these people, they couldn't handle it better. They had so the reason why you could handle it better is because your liver could be filtering better. So the substances which, uh, it's a chemicals which affect your brain is neurotoxins, but they are still toxic. And if your liver function better than liver of these other people, you will see that you get less intoxicated than them. That's what could be happening to you. Uh, the thing is, this is the thing with uh, medicine and laxative. If I take laxative tea now, I wouldn't have a laxative effect on me because my liver would filter this chemical which affects through and for, for normal people, because their whole system compromised, it will affect them, and they will have laxative effect. I think that it, I think that's to do with spiritual understanding. I think if you're spiritual more developed, you can handle these things better. And for some people, it can be so shocking that they complete the whole being changes. But that's why I say this came time for different. Uh, well, what I'm saying is mostly system. affect women much more because uh, naturally women have way more open psyche. And man, they, you know, they okay, unless it's a very sensitive person. Yeah. So, uh, what kind of I I'm supposed to finish a long time ago. Okay. You want to start? <laughs> well, then just a couple words about what we eat to feel satiated on this diet. Uh, the thing is, you're still gonna want some kind of tastes and the complications and cooking, and many people enjoy it. And you can do it, why not? And uh, this kind of things we create to feel satiated and stuff, and like, you know, all sorts of rolls and, and complicated dishes and nice, just present it nice. So you can squeeze more pleasure out of your meal. And then you'll feel less drawn towards cooked stuff. And when you make it like this, you know, and you come and you're looking forward to it and then you imagine in your head like night before, okay, I'm gonna make this, this, this for dinner and then you, you make it and you put it nice and then you come together with your friends or with your husband or someone who can enjoy with you this kind of foods. You sit down, you taste it and this experience is better than you go to a restaurant and eat something which makes you feel sick afterwards. You understand? However nicely it's presented there. So just beat them, you know, beat them. Do better than them. Like, uh, make it tastier. Make it better looking. Make it more exciting. Combine all these tastes together, just like food industry, but in, the, in this uh, raw context, you know? And, and you will be satiated. You, you'll be happy. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.